Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you have any questions for our guests, there are many ways you can contact the show. You can post a question on our wall on Facebook, Skype us, send us a tweet on Twitter to at The Organic View, or you can contact me directly at June Stoyer. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at TheOrganicView.com. Today, I'm pleased to have Drina Burton talk about her brand new book, Let Them Eat Vegan. When you make your own food from scratch, it's not only more economic, but it helps you to connect with your food, where it comes from, and actually who's growing it. The more that people choose to shop consciously, the better it is for the environment. Only when people understand the devastation caused by factory farms operating in a monoculture environment will they understand just how devastating this impact is. That is why more and more people are making the transition to veganism. Plant-based diets are not only more humane, they're healthier. Now, in Drina's book, Let Them Eat Vegan, she has 200 deliciously satisfying plant-strong recipes for the whole family. I mean, she's got so much stuff in here. Um, you'll find what I happen to appreciate the most was all these recipes for the veggie burgers. I mean, it's amazing how much you spend on some of these foods that you've become kind of accustomed to eating because it's just simpler, especially if you're uh, limited with time or if it's just a matter of convenience. Uh, you know, it's, it, the uh, springtime season is here and uh, everybody's schedule is getting uh, really hectic as uh, people's lives are just, you know, going in all sorts of different directions. And the bottom line is, is that Many people do not want to buy products that are in the store that, regardless of whether or not they're organic, vegan or not, some of them are processed, and it's something that kind of defeats the purpose. So in Drina's book, she has so many wonderful recipes, and they're so incredibly easy to make, and she also includes a lot of her own personal uh, bits of advice uh, as far as what she likes to do and why, and I thought that that was a very nice touch, but... Also, these recipes are so kid-friendly, and there are so many teenagers and tweenagers that are making this transition, and it's a really nice trend to see. So I would like to welcome to the show Ms. Drina Burton. Good afternoon, Drina. Hi, June. Thank you so much. That was like a great intro. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. I get, I get really jazzed up when I read a book that has recipes that – are not just kind of recycled recipes with a different, um, a different uh, tip mm -hmm. or flair, whatever you want to call it, but it's interesting. I had been thinking to myself, you know something, lately I'm buying a lot of these vegan burgers just because of the fact that uh, it's a very busy time of the year for me and I want to make sure that my meals are balanced, uh, but you know they're also um, healthy. And... I just realized that, wow, I spend an awful lot of money on these uh, these these vegan burgers yeah. that are ridiculous. I mean, with all the talents that I have, I should be able to whip them up in a heartbeat. And then all of a sudden, um, I get a copy of your book, and I'm like, wow, this is like the Mac Daddy of recipe books that has so many recipes in here for... Well, I mean, there's other recipes in here that are wonderful, but the ones that I personally appreciated were with the the vegan burgers, and I couldn't get over how many recipes you had with chickpeas. And I've been kind of limited with what I've been doing with chickpeas only because I'm still relatively a new vegan. So for me, um, and I love chickpeas, but um, I didn't realize that you could do as many things as you've described, and I think that this is just fantastic. Thank you. It's funny. I have a friend who calls them chickpeas, <laughs> and I think <laughs> they are pretty chic. Um, they are more versatile than we think, and, you know, I, I think a lot of people grew up, if they ever ate beans, it was probably in a chili, and, you know, along with ground beef or whatever, and they haven't had a whole lot of exposure to beans. And 
I love beans. Um, my recipes have always been pretty um, bean-centric. And, um, yeah, I like to show that you can use them in different ways, whether it be a, um, a burger or a casserole or a salad dressing or a pasta sauce. There's tons of things you can do with it and, and spreads and dips and all kinds of things. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. When uh, you think chickpeas, you don't really make that, uh, connection to hummus, and then once you realize how much hummus costs, you're like, hmm, oh. maybe I should start making my own hummus. I, and yeah, I, I never mean, buy hummus anymore, and for a couple of reasons. Because number one, we have three kids, and for how much hummus and and other bean spreads we eat as a family, uh, it's too expensive. And our kids don't like the commercial hummus because it has that. Um, it either is kind of stingy with garlic or it has that citric acid flavor that comes through. Yeah. And they're, they notice it. They have, um, you know, they eat so much whole foods and, and just good, wholesome food that they pick up on that stuff now. So I just, you know, put together triple, quadruple batches of hummus and, um, you know, take out your food processor, do it once, triple the batch, and then freeze portions. It freezes really well. It, it thaws really well. And... It's kind of, you know, it's in rotation, and you can do different varieties, and, and it's there for you. You know, it's interesting how many kids are eating hummus. I mean, the manufacturers are getting pretty slick with the packaging. They're starting to make uh, little little bite-sized portions, I guess. And, you know, I'm seeing, it, I'm seeing it with other types of foods that are not organic, but in the whole conventional foods market, it's amazing how smart these marketers are. They understand that the kids, uh, while kids are always going to be attracted to anything that has a cartoon character on it, they are also uh, quite aware of the fact that, um, you know, they want they should be eating more whole foods yeah. and not all the junk. And so what they're doing is they're trying to make things like uh, peanut butter, yogurt, what, whatever the case may be, more appealing to kids. But the bottom line is is that there's a lot of sugar, not to mention the fact that if it's not organic, the kids are consuming all the pesticides that were used to grow these foods, and that's a very big problem. Uh, and also with so many kids having different issues, uh, food sensitivities rather, uh, the gluten-free issue is a very big concern as well. Absolutely, and I do a number of gluten-free recipes in the book and give gluten-free options um, you know, even with things like burgers, sometimes if you buy a veggie burger, uh, a lot of them have the wheat gluten in them. Or even if they don't have the wheat gluten, they'll have something else in there with, uh, you know, it might be wheat flour or something like that. Um, and making veggie burgers at home, again, it's easy. I think people are intimidated by veggie burgers because they think there's a lot of steps. Um, you know, there's usually some sauteing of, uh, you know, onions and such like that. And then you're moving to the food processor and then you're making the patties. But I created at least three or four recipes in this book that don't even involve the sautéing process. It just goes right to the food processor. You get your key ingredients in there, whiz them up. It's only a matter of shaping patties and either baking them or doing a real quick pan fry, and they're ready. Um, and they taste great, and there's, there's no funny stuff in there, and they're not too spicy for kids because, again, that's, that's another thing is sometimes you buy these veggie burgers and... They have, like, some really strange spices in it that kids won't eat, or they're just dry and unpalatable, and, you know, you want something that tastes good, and, and you can make them for much, much cheaper. And some of them actually, they have, like, a, I don't know, I've seen some brands that I haven't really heard of. You know, every so often uh, the local supermarkets will carry something new, and you figure, okay, let me try this. I'll try it once, and then, uh, you know, maybe I'll compost it, maybe... I don't want to upset my compost bin, you know. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know. If it's not good enough for the compost, it's not good enough to eat. Yeah, right? <laughs> but, uh, it, yeah, the just the appearance of some of these veggie burgers. And uh, it, it's interesting. Burgers were never something that was part of my – it was just not something that I would really um, lean towards as far as meal selection. I mm -hmm. was never a big burger person when I ate meat. And now that I don't, um, it's really got to have some flavor to it. So uh, unlike many kids that don't want all the spices, I really want something that has some flavor to it. Yep. Uh, the vegan burgers that are on the market, um, I don't know if it's just because all they do is they just take a bunch of um, tofu and just mash it together and 
I don't know what else they do to it, but it's just it has no flavor, and yeah. or it has like that 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 typical. Uh, I, I wish I could describe it better, but there's like a distinct flavor with some of these vegan burgers that just you really have to dress it up with a lot of lettuce, tomatoes, and then the uh, veginase uh, or some yeah or some spicy hot mustard just to be able to uh, digest it or just to be able to bite into it even. Yeah, uh, and that's something that kind of turns me off. But with you, I mean. Wow. How long have you been making these veggie burgers? Um, well, it's interesting because um, I, I find with every book, uh, something stands seems to stand out with people with, with my different books. And for this book, a lot of people are talking about the burgers, so it's really cool. Um, and I started this theme of veggie burgers with this book because I was chatting with one of my girlfriends who also has um, her kids are vegan as well, and she was sort of saying, you know, geez, they won't they don't like the veggie burgers. They're always picking out something from them or they don't like the onions in there or they fall apart. And I said, you know, that's true. Sometimes the homemade veggie burgers fall apart. I'm going to come up with some that are nice and sort of sturdy but taste good and have flavor. But they mightn't be spicy, but they have flavor. Um, and so that's kind of what got me going with this one. I've got the nutty veggie burgers, and they're based with um, almonds and walnuts, and they've got um, zucchini and carrots in there and oats, and it's all blended up. And it's just so, like, satisfying when you eat it. It's so filling and satisfying, and it stays together. And then there's um, something like Mediterranean bean burgers where there's some olives in there, and they're made with kidney beans. And um, so there's flavor, but and my kids love those. They have, like, oregano in them and, and olives and good flavor, but they're not that, like, strange taste that you talk about. And maybe that's what my kids pick up on with some of mm. the commercial veg, uh, vegan burgers. So... Um, so, yeah, that kind of just got me on this process of coming up with burgers that were kind of diverse with different ingredients and tasted really good and, you know, would hold together. You could put them on a bun or you could stick them in a pita. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you can use leftovers and put them in sandwiches or you can, some of them work well to make as a loaf, too, and you can um, then have it, like, with a vegan gravy. So, um, you know they're a little more versatile than you think, too. Before we talk about the gravy, because that's something I definitely want to talk about, I just want to discuss briefly the fact that you didn't use any olive. You decided to use roughly chopped Kalamata olives for this Mediterranean bean burger recipe. So the Kalamata olives with, with kidney beans, that is a really interesting combination that I would never have thought of. I mean, it would have probably accidentally, uh, the two might have met on my plate at some point, but to combine them together in a recipe, is, is that something that you've done with other recipes, use the two together? Um, I'm trying to think. I often use olives with um, with chickpeas and white beans. I can't say I've used it with kidney beans before, but I really wanted a, um, I wanted the burger to have that color of the kidney bean burger, so or the mm. kidney beans. So that's what got me on that process. And I was adding um, some tomato paste in there, so I knew to, I knew it was going to take on that color. So I wanted to use the darker bean, and and I just like using different beans too because we do love so chickpeas so much in this house, and the kids love them. I just kind of like you know switch things up, and they're nice um, smooth bean, you know, nice sort of creamy smooth beans. So they work really well um, with with the flavors and. Um, but that's yeah. that's really fantastic. I mean, uh, I taught culinary arts for about 12 years, and I had never thought to combine the red or all well, the red kidney beans. Well, I guess you could use the light red kidney beans as well. But the kidney beans with the Kalamata olives, I think that's just brilliant, especially the the, the robust flavor of mm -hmm. the bean combined with the olives. That's that's got to be one flavorful burger. Now, is that, would you say that that's probably one of um, the favorites amongst not only your readers, but, you know, just family and friends? Um, I think it's certainly one of our favorites, and the Nutty Veggie Burgers are our favorite, too. Like, our kids love those. Um, and um, a lot of people have come back saying they love the Mediterranean bean burgers, for sure. Um, and the Mushroom Pecan Burgers are pretty pretty big up for people, too. Um, no, I... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I know I was just going to say, they do have one more step. There's some sautéing with those, mm -hmm. um, but people do love those because they just have, again, lots of good flavors going on in there. Now, I just want to talk about the Nutty Veggie Burger for a minute. 
Uh, and now, folks, in this recipe, uh, it calls for raw almonds, raw walnuts, pecans, uh, small clove of garlic, sea salt, ketchup, nutritional yeast, tamari, uh, thyme, and dried sage. That's what basically caught my attention with this particular recipe because sage is completely undervalued. People mm-hmm. think sage, I mean, in uh, in just traditional cooking, sage is often associated with Thanksgiving because people would put it to make their, you know, stuffed, uh, stuffed bird or their stuffing. Mm-hmm. And sage has such wonderful flavor and... I just thought that, you know, once again, out of all the spices that you could have used, or the herbs, should I say, uh, this particular herb is just, once again, fantastic, especially uh, especially combined with thyme. Mm -hmm. That's a great combination. Um, Just out of curiosity, I'm kind of fascinated because (laughs) it's not, I mean, I can make a few set of ketchup packets, but it's just, you know, when I come across something like this, I'm in awe because... It's like, how come I didn't think of that? <laughs> it's so fun to talk about this. My husband's getting a total break from my foodie talk. <laughs> um, I I play around with seasoning sometimes, and um, I really love the flavor of fresh thyme anyhow. Like, it's one of my favorite fresh herbs. I love mm. fresh basil. Um, I really like fresh oregano, and fresh thyme is one of my favorites. Um, and um, just a little bit of that dry thyme and sage in there like it's not much but just enough to kind of give it a little sort of back note or something yeah and combined with the nuts though that is really something see with sage i grow a lot of sage and even though i have an abundance of sage i'm maybe i need to experiment more especially with uh just some of the dishes that i'd like to make uh because Sage, I kind of feel, is such a strong herb. Um, I would never think to um, combine it with thyme. Thyme, I usually, I use thyme in sauces. I use thyme on potatoes. Mm -hmm. I love roasted Mm -hmm. roasted potatoes with thyme Mm -hmm. and some olive oil uh, or other vegetables. I think thyme has just such, it's not as strong as oregano, but it, it still has a nice flavor to it. But sage tends to be very powerful and there are a lot of people who are just like eh, you know it's it's a little too much for them and what I typically use sage uh, for in sauces is I'll take um, the like the, the the vegan butter spreads and I'll melt that down and add some freshly chopped sage just so that the essential oil in the sage uh, adheres or should I say incorporates with that the, the, the butter, and then I'll put that over uh, fresh pasta or uh, vegetables, what have you. That's and a good idea. Yeah, it, it, mm-hmm. it's a nice touch, but the combination of the sage and the thyme with all these nuts, you're, you're talking about a lot of powerful flavors here, but combined, if you think about it, that's a really dynamite combination. Take my hat off to you, ma'am. They, well, thank you. I, and and the kids, you know, they don't pick up on any of, like, sometimes they'll pick up on herbs if they're very strong, much like you say with sage. And if I'm using rosemary, sometimes we'll find rosemary too much. But there's just there's just a little in there, so it's not like they are overwhelmed by the flavor at all. They're just eating it up. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's always great to find things like this, especially when, you know, you're, you're talking about different types of foods. Cause, you get sick of eating the same things over and over, and sometimes I'll make the same things just because it's convenient and it's easy, and I know it's a healthier option than, um, you know, doing something different that, you know, might not resonate with my system. But uh, I guess when you kind of have a routine, and especially if you're limited with your time, you try to do the best that you can. But when you come across uh, recipes like these, I mean, the recipes, they don't look as though they would take terribly too long to make whatsoever. And uh, just a combination of the, the the herbs that you use, just brilliant. Thanks. And and I, I would like to add that, yes, they don't take much time. And, and um, something like these burgers, they freeze well, too. So, I mean, if you wanted to do up a couple of batches on the weekend, then they're in the freezer. You can take them out. You've got them for the week. Um, so, you know, it's, it's so quick, and it's not expensive. And, um, you know, it just makes sense to 
to, to make them up from time to time. Now, when you make your burgers and you're preparing them so that they're uniform, uh, I found that especially if you're making anything for kids, kids tend to be a little finicky. Uh, what I usually do is I take the old, my, my old, um, like a, a plastic container, um, or if I have a wide enough uh, coffee mug um, that's uh, you know fairly decent size, and then what I'll do is I'll pre- I'll um, I'll press out the the bat the, the mixture, if you will. And then I'll try to smooth it out so that it's uh, it's even. And then I'll press out the burgers so that they're kind of uniform in shape. Um, do you have any particular method that you'd like to share that you use? Um, that's a that's a great one. That's a great idea. Um, some other, I mean, I tend to freeform with my hands with these burgers because uh, you know it's just what I've gotten used to doing. But when I make um, when I make if I make them into say balls, sometimes I'll do that and bake them. Um, and I do have a walnut uh, pecan ball recipe in there too, and I'll use a cookie scoop to to you know get those, and so just a small cookie scoop for that. And then um, that's that's for me the easiest, either using a large or an ice cream scoop, something like that, just to get mm-hmm. out the the size and scoop it out, and then you can just quickly pat them into um, a nice shape and and get them in the oven or pan fry them. How do you freeze your your burgers? Do you have any particular method to keep them from getting freezer burned? Um, um, yeah, that's a good a, a good question. I um, I use you know um, airtight containers like a Ziploc or something like that. Mm-hmm. But um, I just put a little bit of parchment in between each patty, and um, that way they're easy to take apart. And yeah, the parchment paper is fantastic, isn't it? Oh, oh, it's a wonder. It's it's the greatest thing. I mean, from baking to um, to cooking, and then like this kind of thing where you want to freeze freeze things in layers without them sticking. Um, and then a little bit of plastic wrap over the top, pop them in the freezer, and, you know, they're probably good for a month or two without getting freezer burn. Ours don't usually last in the freezer that <laughs> long, hmm. but, yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to do the same. I found that the parchment paper really works best. It's, it's funny, when I was little, my mother used to use wax paper. Yes, and mom, my mom did too, that's right. A lot of people use wax paper, yeah. and what I found with the parchment paper was parchment paper is great because you can actually put it in the oven mm-hmm. when you're defrosting, and you can you can bake with parchment paper. So uh, you know this way you're not just uh, using it for one purpose; you can repurpose okay. the paper and and bake it in the oven. But uh, there's a company; it's actually Canadian, and I wish I could think of the name of the company, but I ran into some of, the, some of their uh, staff at, uh, I think it was the New York Fancy Food Show, and there's a company that um, I'm sure there are a lot of chefs out there or foodies out there that know the company, but they're Canadian-based, and the paper that they use is not treated with any chemicals. And um, if I can, I know I wrote down... <laughs> no, I wrote down the name of the company, but there are a lot of companies that are, you know, trying to produce the same type of materials where, you know, you don't have all these chemicals, you don't have all this stuff. Um, and with wax paper, you know, that's paraffin wax. That stuff is derived from petroleum. Right. So all the more reason to get away from it, you know. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, some of the parchments aren't aren't bleached. They're like the natural color. And um, I, I may have bought that one myself because I know there's one that I buy that is, is not the bleach, it's, it's just the natural parchment, but I don't remember the name either. If I come across it, I'll, I'll email it to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now, my next question is condiments. I have had so many issues with condiments, and for the most part, I make my own, but I actually had a friend say to me, you know, um, how do you make vegan condiments, especially if you have gluten-free issues and uh, you're just very sensitive, and also, you know, maybe if you're just picky. I mean, for me, if I want ketchup, I'll make my own ketchup. But you no, know, not everybody has the time, nor has the desire to sit there and make uh, their own condiments. Plus, I mean, I have to give away a lot of my stuff because there's only how much ketchup does one person need? Right. Well, our kids could eat a lot. <laughs> kids are different. Kids would eat ketchup on cereal or something. Um, but yeah, I I do a number I a number of like dressings and sauces and dips and things in this book because I really like that. I mean, I'm a flavor person, so I mm. love having sauces and things to accompany um, 
you know, a casserole or a grain or even a, a patty um, or to put on salad. So I love making dressings and sauces and dips and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I have a chapter called Saucy and Dippy <laughs> and say I'm a little bit of both because I just love making those sauces. I've always loved sauces, like from, you know, the time I was a kid. Um, so, you know, another another thing with this book is I don't use, um, you know, substitutes that people are trying to get away from. I mean, it's totally yeah. fine when you want to use them and for convenience, but not everybody wants to buy um, vegan mayonnaise or vegan margarine and that kind of exactly, thing. Exactly, exactly. And that, that thank you for bringing that up. I meant to bring that up as yeah. well. I, I thought that that was really nice for change where, you know, you're making people think about what's in their food. You're forcing them to really reconnect with, okay, well, you know, if I'm buying this, it doesn't matter if it's organic and it's vegan, but if you're buying uh, a, a butter substitute, if you will, uh, you know, it, once again, it's something that people used to make themselves. Right. Right, and there's things, you know, and everyone likes to have a little bit of convenience, and it's fine, but do we need to cook with it all the time, or do we need to bake with it all the time? And, well, I kind of say, no, we don't. There's things we can use that we have at home all the time, um, that are basics, um, like our beans and our nuts and our seeds and vegetables, and they can be, you know, employed in pretty um, simple ways sometimes to make a sauce. Like I, I have a um, a substitute for mayonnaise, and I make it with almonds, and I call it almonase. Um, yeah, I, that was just fantastic. I'm actually going to make some of that this weekend. I thought that that was just brilliant, because if you think about the almonds, there's a lot of fat in almonds. I mean, it's a good fat. It's not a bad fat. Unfortunately, the F word here, yeah. that word, uh, people tend to get all bent out of shape, and they don't realize that you need fat in order to live. Yes. Yeah. And unfortunately, nuts have had such a bad rap because of different nutritionists and dietitians and people that, I don't know if they knew what the hell they were talking about, but uh, they really gave the whole nut industry uh, a bad, uh, just, a whole bad uh, rap, and it's just, it's a shame. But uh, the that was such a great recipe. What prompted you to come up with that? Were you just like, you know what, there's got to be something better out there? Yeah, well, I, okay, for one thing, I have one of those big blenders, you know, the Blendtec, some people have mm-hmm. the Vitamix, and they're so good at processing nuts and seeds into really creamy textures, and So I had been doing a lot of things with cashews, um, like I have some cashew sauces in there. And, um, yeah, I just started playing around with almonds. And I add, like, a little bit of dill seed or celery seed. Um, My kids aren't the spot, you know, they're not the happiest when I add the the seeds, but if I leave it out, they like it. Um, But that (laughs) little bit of celery seed or dill seed just just gives that note that you'd like to have, you know, for a spread on a sandwich or, or a veggie burger or something like that. And um, and I'm so glad you brought that up about nuts because, you know, there is that sentiment of, oh, you know, sort of being a little bit wary of fat. But when you have kids, too, I mean, they need to have these good fats. And um, I have no problem with my kids eating nuts and nut-based burgers and things like that. It's whole foods, and it's good for them. Um, you know, it's so interesting. I just want to point this one thing out. There's this product that they're pushing all over uh all over America um it's Nutella and the commercial goes there's just a hint of cocoa and it's hysterical because when you look at the package the stuff is junk i can't understand why people would give this to their kids but um it's giving the parent the illusion that they're giving something healthy to their kids and honestly it reminds me of um I don't know, the, the the chocolate milk mixes that um, are just a little liquefied that have more well, like a, a flavor of some type of nutty flavor in it. And yeah. I, I just can't understand how they're getting away with saying that it's nutritious. But then again, if you look at all the other um, non-organic, process, highly processed foods that are on the market, that's exactly what they're doing. They're taking something that actually is good and they're dumping all sorts of oh. junk in it and pushing it on the kids. Yeah, there's very, you know, little of what's good in that product. What, how much of there is, uh, how much there would be of na- hazelnuts in there. And cocoa's not the problem. And they say just a little bit of cocoa. Cocoa's not the problem. It's all the other stuff they've got in there. Exactly. I yeah. mean, if it were dark, organic, vegan chocolate, then I'd say, hey, you know what? Those are your antioxidants. 
Um, and that's you know, a whole other subject, but cho- organic dark chocolate also because of the chocolate industry where they have so much milk and sugar and all yeah. sorts of preservatives and, you know, the, the uh, myriad of junk that they put in it, it takes something that is healthy and nutritious, dark chocolate, uh, and, you know, makes it unhealthy. Absolutely. And that's what, you know, so much of what kids' food is. It's, I find it very sad because, I, you know, I see um, what a lot of kids are eating and so much of it is processed and packaged. And packaged to minutia too, like you know, small packages of everything. I mean, I make my kids lunches every day, and they go off with containers of food, and they come home with containers that you know I clean up and, and sort out and whatever. And everything that seems to be going out there, if you look at you know what kids are eating, um, so little of it is made from home or just homemade, and everything is processed and in the little tiny packages of everything. Um, so little of it is actually food, too. Um, I don't know what's bulking it up, but little of it is actual real food. So, mm. yeah. Now, in regards to your the, the almond uh, almonds, mm. is that what you called it? Almonds. Almonds. Yeah. Yeah. How did you? So, what prompted you to use almonds out of all the nuts? Why almonds? Uh, I I don't know. I think I like I said I've been playing with the cashews and. Um, just kind of wanted to try something with almonds because sometimes, like you talk about, you use the same foods a lot, and I found I'd been using cashews a lot, and let's like try using something else. Um, and they, it's interesting because they're not as creamy as cashews because when you do a blend with cashews and you soak cashews, they become so creamy you don't even know that there's a nut in there. Um, and when you do almonds, they don't get quite as creamy even using the, um, you know, the power blender, what I call my ramble blender. Um, it's still like you can still get a little bit of texture, um, but they have a different taste. Like they just have this kind of earthiness or something that tastes really good, and they have a real clean flavor. So, yeah, I just um, just wanted to kind of play around with that a little bit and use give people variety because cashews are so great in um, in vegan recipes these days, but a lot of people, again, have allergies, and so mm. I'm trying to be conscious of, okay, try not to use too much of this or give a substitute so that people can do it this way. Um, I'm kind of always thinking of that as I go through my recipes and, and create things. And um, I had made a couple of cashew-based sauces, so um, it's time to switch things up. Now, another question that I have for you is with um, just the incorporation of the nuts or even the chickpeas, I mean, there's so many different things that you've done where you've combined uh, the nuts with the beans. Um, Are there, do you have any preference? I mean, should we be buying the the, the raw nuts and the dried chickpeas, or do you think that uh, it's okay if you buy them canned? Uh, Do you have any preference? Oh, that's a a good question. Okay, so I think the thing is with raw nuts is... um, Toasted nuts, you get a little bit more flavor out of to- toasted nuts. Um, but raw nuts, uh, you know, there is a little bit more versatility. So I think and te- you, if you buy toasted nuts, sometimes they're salted and that kind of thing. So yeah. I opt for the, you know, raw organic nuts. And then if you want to toast them a little bit and add a little bit of extra flavor, then you can do that yourself. Um, and it doesn't take too long. Um, or if there's a nut that you really like that's toasted, then, you know, buy some of those. Um, but I think you just have a little bit more um, flexibility if you buy them raw and, um, you know, you can keep them in the freezer in, in bulk, that kind of thing. And with beans, I, you know, I would love to cook them all from scratch. I just don't have time to. And I do in batches from, uh, on occasion, I'll do some batches of chickpeas or white beans or something like that and freeze them up. Um, but I buy the uh, BPA um free beans like Eden Organic. Now, speaking of Eden, yeah. Eden is actually offering to our listeners 20% off uh, non-bulk orders if you use the uh, the code ORGVIEW, and that's O-R-G-V-I-E-W at checkout. And if you go to theorganicview.com, there's uh, an image for Eden Foods. It, it has a direct link that will take you right to the site, and it, it will give you the, the code. So, uh, especially with the beans, I I love Eden's beans, and I only buy their beans. They taste um, cleaner than 
they and I can say that even I've bought some other BPA free beans and mm -hmm. like for instance the chickpeas, their beans still taste better than other BPA free beans. Yeah, I, I agree. Know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting when you first start eating chickpeas, you don't really know you know one bean from the other, and then when you start tasting some of the other brands, you're just like, wow, you know what? This bean just you know it, it it's like oh okay what was I uh, you know punished. <laughs> yeah, you were punished for buying something other than Eden, right? But right. Uh, <laughs> and maybe that's why people, you know, don't think beans taste so good because some of them don't taste so good when they're canned. Um, and then if you try, you know, a, a better quality brand, well, you'll notice that they do taste much better. So. I like the diversity. Sometimes I like the canned beans. Uh, and when Eden came out with their the, the beans with the you know the BPA free cans. Um, all I thought to myself was, no wonder why some of these other brands of beans don't taste as good. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you don't know what they're doing to them. I mean, they list, um, you know, they they have beans that are listed in the ingredients, but you don't know what preservatives they're using. And uh, that's that's a very big concern because the more foods that we consume where we don't know exactly what the manufacturer is doing. Uh, that's more of a problem, and it's coming out as far as different allergies that we have to foods as well as different health issues, so on and so forth. And when it comes to kids, you want to keep them as chemical-free as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it is peculiar how much there is, you know, all the allergies that are prevalent now and um, all of the food intolerances, it seems to be stemming from something we're doing. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's very, very concerning. I'm thankful, knock wood, my kids don't have any allergies at all. Um, I did introduce food to them pretty carefully, you know, on a schedule where I introduced gluten free grains first and then gluten grains and just kind of worked up to the things that are higher potential for allergies. Um, but still, you never know with that. And I, you know, I'm just so happy that they don't. Um, I still play around with lots of allergen free recipes uh, for other people, but it's um, yeah, it's 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 strange what's going on with all the allergies. Well, I think the bottom line is is that the more that people connect to where their food is grown, how they're grown, and who's producing it, uh, in other words, get to know your farmer, get yeah. to know the people that are producing your food. Stop demanding all these varieties that are being imported from faraway lands where. We can't control how it's grown or what it's subjected to. And the one thing that people really don't know anything about is the fact that when it comes to logistics, and what I mean by logistics is the transport of these foods from foreign countries, the people that are hauling this stuff, it, it, you know, cargo is cargo. It's not like there's going to be a little delicate uh uh, temperature controlled section where they're going to keep one particular food everything's going to be lumped together mm -hmm. and it, whether it's uh, produce to uh, shelf stable foods the bottom line is is that it goes through that transport process so uh, if it's coming in from outside the country it's irradiated so do you really want to is it really necessary to demand imported foods mm -hmm. I mean you know that's a very big problem and the more that people demand locally grown organic foods, the better. I mean, it also affects the farmers because of the fact that uh, some of these imported foods bring with it different diseases and pests. And these are, these are the very reasons why some of the farmers are dealing with um, different uh, crop issues, such as uh, the, citrus the citrus farmers in Florida. They're dealing with the psyllid that came from South America. And... What I think is the most ironic thing is that Florida produces the best citrus uh, in the world, and what, yet we're importing citrus from faraway countries. Right. This doesn't make sense. Right. right. And not to say that California citrus is bad. It's, California citrus is great, too, but uh, I'm just saying it's ridiculous that we grow the best or we produce the best citrus in this country, and this is what we're doing. Right. But um, getting back to uh, the recipes, uh, the next question that I have for you is polenta. There are a lot of people who screw up polenta. Now, I don't, but I know that I've had a lot of questions from the audience as far as working with polenta and how to properly cook it so that it's cooked 
it, it's not uh, too gummy and it's not too. I don't know. You could do all sorts of things to plant it to screw it up. Uh, <laughs> do you have any recommendations? Well, it's kind of like I mean, people seem to have the same thing with rice and all kinds of grains. It's easy to overcook it, or it becomes too sticky, that kind of thing. Um, I the thing with polenta is it's really best when it's just made, and then it doesn't stand and get too gummy. Mm. So it is a little. I find it's a little bit time sensitive. Um, but even saying that, I have made it, and then you know when we're sitting and having our, our dinner, and the kids want more or whatever. I, if I go back and just work a little bit more non-dairy milk into it and keep it creamy, then it it's great. Um, but it does taste best when it's sort of just hot and nice and, um, you know, straight out of the pan, sort of pours right onto your plate and just has a nice creamy, luscious quality. Um, yeah, and I find adding a little bit of, you know, using some non-dairy milk, um, that makes it creamy. And it's funny because, you know, Traditionally, when you see polenta recipes, they tend to have something like Parmesan cheese in there. Um, and I found it found that by adding just like a little bit of lemon zest to the polenta, it just kind of pops it and brings it um, brings it up in flavor. It's mm-hmm. not just creamy and flat, but it just kind of adds a little nice um, tangy note that just kind of comes through. It's really, really subtle, but it's nice. Now, I just want to make one comment uh, about the lemon zest. Folks, uh, if you're going to use lemon zest, make sure that the lemons that you're using mm-hmm. are certified organic because otherwise you're basically getting the pesticides right in with whatever it is that you're serving. So just That's a little a note point. about that. Absolutely. Uh, now, you also uh, wrote about a vegetable that I actually had not a good relationship with for most of my life, and that's cauliflower. Oh, I never I liked... I to say fennel. <laughs> no, fennel actually, fennel's kind of interesting, but... Um, uh, I can't exactly talk about what I used to do to fennel, but because uh, it involved uh, certain um, uh, certain things that I no longer eat. But uh, now that I've learned to make convert all my recipes basically to plant-based versions, well, um, I still have a little bit to go, but I'm getting there. But uh, cauliflower, I just wanted to talk about because cauliflower. It's something you either love or you hate, and I never really liked cauliflower. I, I love vegetables, always loved vegetables. I was one of those odd kids that would love to eat uh, Brussels sprouts. And, um, you know, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, asparagus, you name it, love vegetables. That's Didn't good. like cauliflower. Uh, I've never liked cauliflower either. I'm a bit of a recent convert <laughs> <laughs> with cauliflower, too. And if my earlier books did not have cauliflower. Um, so I understand that completely, and it's funny because I was on Facebook the other day and talking about how I was sort of just mocking up this cream of cauliflower soup, and it came out so good, and I loved it. And I had a few people saying, what, you're using cauliflower? Because for a long, long time, I just never liked it. But um, And I still don't like it raw. Uh, I don't like broccoli raw, and I don't like cauliflower raw. But I do like it with, you know, just that right amount of cooking. And so, yeah, I've used it in a few recipes here. Is it the roasted one that you're thinking of? or This is the, yeah, the almond roasted Roast. cauliflower. I actually okay. began liking cauliflower once I started growing it in the garden. I bought it by accident, and I was annoyed. I was just like, ah, oh, great, now I'm growing this. and uh... I did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it by accident, too. I thought it was kale and <laughs> had cauliflower growing. That's funny. Yeah, it's it's amazing how uh, things kind of work out to your advantage, and all of a sudden it's like, well, you know what? I've got cauliflower. I'm just going to eat it and right. like it, and uh, I did. That was ah. the irony. I figured uh, I had actually called uh, uh, a family member who happens to love cauliflower. I'm like, oh, guess what? You're going to get this summer tons of cauliflower, <laughs> and then uh, I had uh, picked some and. I said, you know, some, I, I just put a little bit in a salad, and just the flavor, when you're growing organic ca- mm-hmm. cauliflower from your own garden, the mm-hmm. flavor is just amazing. And then I'm like, hey, now, you know, you like this it. is good stuff. But don't you find that happens, too? I mean, I found, I mean, as long as I've been vegan, and it's been over 15 years, I still, my, you know, over time, there's new things I come to like. And so, you know, maybe one day I will like raw cauliflower. <laughs> I just think your palate tends to accept and adjust and, and find more interesting things in food than it once did. So, 
Uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. And plus I have had a number of guests that um, eat, th- th- they're raw, organic vegans, and um, I like a lot of the raw recipes, and mm-hmm. I think raw is fantastic, but mm-hmm. I, I, I'm in New York. The winters are a little rough here. I mean, we had a very mild winter this past win- this past year, but uh, every every now and then I enjoy eating soup. I like coffee, um, mm-hmm. and sometimes I like to eat bread. I'm a human being. What can I say? But uh, <laughs> I know, I know. But I, I like hot food sometimes. Uh, but during the summertime, especially since I have an abundance of freshly grown vegetables, you know, right outside my door, uh, it's just mm-hmm. it. It really does not take much time to make raw dishes, and uh, it's not. It's not what people think. People tend to think that it's just eating salad after, you know, one salad after the other, and it's not. Uh, there's so many different things that you can oh, yeah. do. And, you know, you. it sounds like you have the ultimate blender. Mm-hmm. And just out of curiosity, uh, did you spend over $1,000 for it? No, because I, I'm I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm a, an affiliate um, with my – I was an affiliate with my blog. So, um um, when you're an affiliate, they give you the blender to work with and test with and that kind of thing. But they are about five or six hundred dollars. But you wow. know, I, I would I would buy it over. Like if I if someone were to take that blender out of my house, I would buy another one because <laughs> I I use it to I use it at least once a day, sometimes two three times a day. Absolutely. Is it a juicer too, or just a blender? What's that? Is it a juicer too, or does it just puree and and mince and all that? It's it's no, it's a blend tech, so it's it's a blender, so um, it's not a juicer. So I use um like I do in the morning, I do green smoothies every morning without fail, um, and they're they're just part of our day. We love them, and then if I'm making a sauce like my macaroni that I have in the the book, it's called Mac O'Gee's and the sauce that's in there. Um, it's a a nut based sauce, so I use the blend tech to whir that up and. Mind you, some of the sauces can be used or can be done in a regular blender, like that sauce you could do in a regular blender. Um, and then um, nut-based sauces and dressings and um, purees for ice creams and that kind of thing. It's just it's a magical tool. It's really good. And when you make your ice cream, do you use a machine or do you just uh, kind of um, pop it in the freezer? Do you have any particular method? I have um, I have the KitchenAid um, attachment to the mixer. So you know the KitchenAid mixer that you use for you know cookies, etc. They have an attachment that is just a bowl, and it pops in the freezer, and then you can take it out and literally just pop it onto the base of the mixer. And so that's what I use. And you know I know a lot of people have you know ice cream makers. I that's the only one I've used, um, but that's my method. And then sometimes I'll do a frozen banana kind of ice cream and for that you just need a food processor and you just put it in there and whir the thing up I add some nut butter that kind of thing um, but for the ice creams most of the ice creams in this book I use the um, attachment to the KitchenAid mixer I actually have one of those um, uh, one of the Bronco ice cream makers uh, <laughs> they're kind of fascinating I mean you have to use the rock salt and all that but uh, oh okay it's I mean, it depends upon how anal you want to be with the end result. Um, if uh, if if you want to make a true ice cream, you know, the texture without it um, crystallizing too much, then by all means use the machine. But uh, say if you're just, you know, you're just kind of craving ice cream, but you don't want to go for the bad stuff, you want to go for, you know, the stuff that's plant-based, um, can you freeze Is there any particular method that you would recommend to freeze it? Um, you could freeze it, and you'd have to take it out and give it some, like, stirring through um, during its freezing, or you could freeze it partially, take it out, pop it in the food processor, give it a whiz, get it back into the freezer, and then you might have to repeat that um, just because it, you know, it will set up very solid. And so if you can catch it as it's setting up and give it a, a whir through the food processor, that works. Um, and if you want something in an instant, um, like, you know, if you keep frozen bananas, I always keep bananas frozen chopped um, in the freezer. That's uh, a good idea to keep them chopped because then they're more versatile. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're easy to use. You can measure them, that kind of thing. 
So if you chop them up, throw them in a container or a bag and get them in the freezer, then you have them ready for smoothies and, you know, I'll use them for that instant ice cream fix and you pop them in your food processor, just a pinch of salt, um, some cashew butter is really good in there and if you want a little bit of maple syrup, you could, but sometimes it's sweet enough you don't and then you, you process, process that through. Um, you could add a little bit of cinnamon, that kind of thing, and it's it's delicious. It's so creamy. The nut butter just makes it that much more luscious, and you don't need too much either, like a few tablespoons of, say, cashew butter to about maybe three cups of frozen bananas, and it's really good. Um, our kids love that one. I think that's a smart idea to chop the bananas ahead of time because it. Uh, I used to leave them whole and, because they would make uh, fruit smoothies out of them, yeah. and... Most people think that the smoothies, especially because of all the commercial uh, milkshakes, if you will, that are pushed on the mainstream market, that smoothies contain all sorts of uh, animal-based products, so on and so forth. And the original smoothies were actually derived from plant-based ingredients. Yeah. Now, with your green smoothie that you mentioned uh, this morning, um, do you have any particular recipe that you use, or do you kind of just have a basic and then you add what you what's available to it? Um, for this book, June, I actually put together a bit of a tutorial for people for making green smoothies um, because I find, and I do have a couple of examples of actual recipes, but I wanted to kind of give people the logistics of it more than more so than different recipes, so to understand um, what goes into the green smoothie, what you need to kind of balance out the bitterness of the greens, um, things you can add, which fruits work best, how to use, you know, how frozen fruit make it, will make the, the green smoothie creamier, something like frozen mangoes or frozen bananas, um, and then sort of balancing out the green bitterness to the fruits. And certain greens are different. Like if you start out making a green smoothie with spinach, um, you don't need much sweet fruit with the spinach because it's not as strong tasting as something like kale. Mm. Um, so you can kind of work up to the heartier greens. Like I, I started making my smoothies with, with spinach, and now I use either collard greens or kale. And um, I Oh, use nice. Collard, yeah, yeah. And so I use collard greens quite a lot. And, um, you know, sort of my staple in the house is collard greens with some apple, um, a little bit of frozen banana, and sometimes some mango. And I'll throw in some chia seeds or hemp seeds a little bit of ice water, and ready to go. Sometimes I put a little bit of cucumber in there, um, you know, kind of mix it up with vegetables too. And I find that, again, it's that palate thing where you might start with a lot of fruit to begin with, but you can start to then add more vegetables or more greens and, and your palate will adjust. So it's kind of the thing you play with. But I like to give people a framework of, hey, this is how you can do it. It's um, you know, you can use a regular blender. You can even use an immersion blender. And um, that's how I started making green smoothies. And just kind of play with it. Um, and I give lots of tips and tricks and things of just to kind of get used to the proportions of fruit through greens and get used to it all. One of the things that I tend to put in my breakfast smoothies is dandelion greens. Just a couple. Oh, yeah. Just like three to four just because it's uh, it, it's a great way to, quote, unblock things that are blocked. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it, it, when you pick the baby greens, they're always sweet. The yeah. bigger greens are always going to be bigger. Uh, they're always going to be uh, chewy, and uh, also they're going to have a stronger flavor. Yeah. But it, it, it's just like picking spinach leaves. When you have the big spinach leaves, they're always going to be rough. They're always yeah. going to be a little on the bitter side. But when you pick the young spinach leaves, it's always going to be sweeter, you know, that natural sugar is what you're kind of going for so that you don't have to add anything additional. And um, I, I just found that um, just the addition of just a few dandelion greens, uh, they're very healthy uh, as far as uh, for urinary tract, your urinary tract, should I say. And uh, they also are important for keeping your body regular. Yes, that's, that's a very good tip. And I think it's like you say, um, you know, when you just add a little bit and you kind of adjust and see how you go with it, um, it's it's surprising what <laughs> what kinds of things. Like when I first started making a kale smoothie, my husband, he just rolled his eyes and said, oh, my God, Trina, I'm not going to have <laughs> kale in my drink. Just stop. Um, you know, like I'm you and that blender. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
but uh, you know, it's kind of the evolution of of how you eat and and try new foods and all of that. Now, speaking of which, uh, how has he adapted to all these zillions of recipes that you come up with? I mean, to him, is it like a culinary safari, or is he like, okay, my crazy wife with her her plant based plant based uh, vegan stuff? Okay, what are we eating tonight? <laughs> He's pretty lucky, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> That's what I say. I think so too. And um, you know, he's he's been great because I I talk to people who sometimes, you know, the the woman is vegan and the husband is not, or vice versa, or you know, whatever the the couple is that that's not always they're on the same page. And I would find that a little tricky. Um, but he's been vegan with me, like we took the journey together. And um, when we had kids, they grew up vegan, and so it's. They laugh at me, though. They're like, Mom, you have hundreds and hundreds of recipes now. How many more do you need to make? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, they, they get a kick out of it, but I think they eat pretty well. They're, they're you know, they're a little spoiled sometimes. <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah. Um, uh, just out of curiosity, with um, with the neighborhood kids, and uh, especially if they go on play dates and stuff, um I would think that especially some of your friends and their friends' parents obviously know that um, you're strict about adhering to a plant-based diet, but how do you handle or how, what do you tell your kids when they're out with other kids and say, you know, they're, they have a soccer game or something and, the, and uh, I guess the chaperone or chaperone, should I say, they say, oh, yeah, let's stop at McDonald's after the game and get something to eat. Uh, that that happens. My my oldest girl, she has gone on, excuse me, um, you know, sports trips and that kind of thing. Like just, I mean, back and forth too. Yeah, that freaks me running. out. How do you handle yeah. that? Um, they're, well, they're they're so used to it. It's so much part of their life now that they and my eldest is almost eleven, so she quite understands everything and she embraces it. And she's she's a real animal lover anyhow. Mm-hmm. So she, you know, she's really good. She, sometimes they go to Starbucks and that, and she might just get a juice. Um, I always pack them with so much snacks when they go out that they are rarely wanting for anything anyhow, and I tend to pack enough for the car. <laughs> yeah. I'm always feeding people, sending food with people as they go. So, um, But they're both at age. My two older girls are both at ages where they really understand the diet, and yeah. they can explain it to their friends anyhow. And their teachers, you know, they know how we eat, and I tend to bring little goodie bags to school because... There's always, you know, birthdays or treat days, so I have their little bag of snacks. But I find that the awareness in the last couple of years has really changed, and there's much more understanding and openness, so that when we started, it was quite frowned upon, and people were, you know, odd. You know, we, they thought we were quite odd with what we were doing. But now it's more... Now they're coming to you saying, hey, Adriana, give me some of your recipes. Yeah. what's going on? I want to try this. So, for instance, yeah. in, in my middle girls' class, I have three or four other moms who are cooking for my cookbooks and asking, you know, how do you do this? <laughs> and so when they have party days, they're, I'm not the one bringing in the vegan cookies now. It's someone else. So it's great. You know, it's like they're doing some of the work for me. That's so fantastic. It's, yeah, yeah, there's more awareness, and it's it's just coming along on its own. Uh, Joanna, can you tell our audience what your, um, your website is and also uh, – your other book and how they can keep up with you on social media. For sure, um, they. I'm on Facebook um, and Twitter. My name is, you know, my handle is Drina Burton on Twitter, and um, my new website will be PlantPoweredKitchen.com. Love and it. And my current blog is BeLaVegan.blogspot.com. Fantastic, Drina. Your book, Let Them Eat Vegan, is amazing. I absolutely love all of the inspiration that you've given me and you've just, I mean, perfect timing. So I was kind of getting bored with a lot of the things that I was making, but you really, just some of your combinations just fantastic. Great job on on this book. And I definitely would love to have you come back to talk about your other book. So thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. I, I had a really good time talking with you, June, and I'd love to have a chat again. Thanks so much. Everyone, we are out of time. But thank you so much for tuning in. And if you've missed the show, you can always subscribe to The Organic View on iTunes or visit our podcast archives at www.theorganicview.com. Have a great day, everyone.